Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I, I do appreciate you all turning up for the first session in the morning, especially after the, uh, the reception last night, because uh, certainly my day, it was always hard getting up in, the, in, those, uh, in those circumstances. And I must have done something wrong to the organizing committee, because they seem to be getting these early morning slots, which kind of sucks. But <laughs> so not only is it early in the morning, and we're all suffering from well, hangovers, but I'm also trying to introduce a subject which, on the surface, is incredibly boring. <laughs> and I'm going to try my best to make it interesting and exciting and everything like that. But sometimes, you know, it's, it's a hard subject to, uh, to keep going. Um, so this is tester-driven development, which is a, a strange technique where you write your tests before you write any code, which... Again, as on the surface, that, that is odd, but we'll, we'll come into that. Um, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I've been around for a while. Um, living proof that you can teach old, uh, a dinosaur new tricks, or an older dog new tricks. Um, I've been using Progress for, uh, I hate to say decades, but it's more than decades. It's <laughs> a few decades now, which is quite scary. It feels like it sometimes, <laughs> especially when I look at code that's got include files in it. It's like, oh my god, that <laughs> certainly feels like centuries. Um, I'm the, the author of several open source projects. Uh, a few of you might have been using Stomp libraries uh, for, for communication and messaging and stuff like that. And back in the day, we had V8 stuff and V9 stuff, uh, myself and Peter Van Dam, where we uh, hosted a whole heap of free utilities and and stuff like that. Uh, so less of me. Test first, code second. It's very, very different from traditional methods of development. Um, it is also requires very, very much uh, everyone to buy into the process. It's expensive in terms of time. <laughs> start with. So your development time is going to be much more than you're used to, but then you don't have to then write the tests. Because one of the problems with the traditional development method is that you write the code and then go, oh, we don't have time to write tests. We've got to get the next feature in. We've got to get the next function in. And your code then ends up not, being, not having unit tests or, or anything like that. And the problem with, with not writing the tests right away is that you will then never get to do it. Because there's always something else more important. And during this talk, we'll show you why it's important to write the tests as soon as possible. Uh, what TD, TDD also does, it also focuses you on writing the code that is required. Who, who's here guilty of... of what I call gold plating the tap, where you think, oh, well, I'll just add this just in case, or I'll, I'll add this feature, or I'll add that little feature because, yeah, that's cool and it makes me look cool. And, and I can say, hey, I've written 10,000 lines of code today when three lines would do type thing. And there's, yeah, it, it is hard to make the switch. It's uh, very difficult. It's also extremely difficult to implement for existing projects um, it, because your code base is already there. You, you tend to write the tests for the code. So you know, because you've written the code, you know what's, what it's going to do. So you write the test because that's how you're, you, you, oh, how we think, I, I should say. Oops. So it's not new. <laughs> Maybe new to us, but it started in sort of like 89, 90. And if you look at the bottom there, you've got Pro Unit and OE Unit, 2004, 2010. This is 14 years ago, guys. And ever since 2018, ABL Unit, which was a fork of OE Unit, I think, which was a fork of Pro Unit, um, it's been supplied by Progress. So every installation has this. 
a bill unit. So as progress developers, we can use some of the tools that are in our progress uh, libraries to help us write these tests. Um, there is a, you can see how old this is, because <laughs> sourceforge.net, that's uh, one of the first uh, source platforms, open source platform. Um, obviously the slides will be available uh, offline. If you have a look, have a look at that uh, link, it compares all the different types of testing frameworks. It uh, tells you what you have, what you don't have, all the bits and pieces. Um, I'm going to try and, um, when I say motor through this, there's a lot of slides, so I, I don't want to uh, go, to, go to that website just yet. We, we can do if we get the time. So the normal development cycle, we write our code, we run our tests, do we? <laughs> Honestly, people, is the, this is okay. This is this is a, um, a in the ideal world uh, scenario. Who? I don't know if I should would ask this because I don't know if you guys would be honest or not. Who doesn't write tests? Hey, we have honesty. <laughs> well, at least a third of the room is honest. The other two thirds are going now. No, I'm not going to admit to that. Um, I was saying yesterday, actually, about uh, some, some uh, a company I once did some work for, and their, their idea of version control was patching live code which <laughs> on a production server. <laughs> it's just terrifying. They didn't have tests, needless to say. Um, we then deploy, because that, that's our thing. We, we, we get our specification, we get our... our functional spec, our requirement spec. We, we shove it out to the developer. The developer writes this code, thinks it's the best thing since sliced bread, commits it, sends it to the QA people, and the QA people test. And go, yes, everything's fine. How many of you have ever said, oh, that's an edge case? Never thought of that. Never came across that before. That's because we don't think about the tests. We just write, write tests according to uh, what we think they should be. And then we fix bugs, because most of the time we don't find the bugs until they hit production. And the customer's database goes down, and we wonder why, and there's a million locks in the lock table, and oh, God, yes, there's a share lock there. Didn't see that. <laughs> so we, we hit these, these, these issues. The TDD cycle, we write the test. I can see a few people going, yeah, okay, this is just nuts. Um, so, for example, the, the process is, right, I'm going to write a test. So my first test would be I need to create my class. I don't have a class. So how do I, I now build this class according to my test? So now my test runs because my class is instantiated. So it makes you think step by step about things. So you can see that we're we're going backwards and forwards and back and oh sorry round and round. The the interesting thing is you're fixing the bugs because you're writing the code straight away. So the developer is fixing the bugs that he didn't even know he was going to introduce at that point in time. But because your um, the the process that you're writing is, is f actually very very focused, you can identify a lot of things straight away. And as a developer, you can pick up on this stuff uh, faster. Um, I don't know if this is in the slide later, but there, there is a, um, uh, a study which shows that fixing bugs in production can be up to 100 or 1,000 times more expensive than fixing it in development. So, you know, if you're, you know, a, a developer doesn't necessarily care about that, but what you do want to be doing, or getting your developers to be doing, certainly, is to be your developers to be writing features, writing new parts of the application, not bug fixing. If half your developers are spending all their time fixing bugs, you've got a real problem because they're not productive. And your, your, your competitors may get out in front of you because they can deliver better software faster 
uh, than, than you do. <coughs> and that's just continually looping around. So you really should, um, you build up each line of the tests, write the code, run the test, write the code, run the test, write the code, until you're ready to deploy. Because at this stage, most of the testing has been done by the developer as he's writing. So the QA people can literally do an integration test, smoke test, and, and everything should, should be right because it, it works. One of the other benefits you get from this, of course, is that you, you require a spec. How many, how many times has someone come into us and said, oh, I need, I need to do a, build a, a do-wazzy today? I've, I've promised the customer they can have it by Thursday. And it must, it must do this, must do that. There's no spec. So in, in the year's time, when you come back to it and look at it, you go, well, what was this for? What's the purpose of it? It's not documented. So then trying to put release notes together is hard, and, and so on and so forth. So we, we have red-green refactor. You would always expect in, the, in this methodology for your tests to fail immediately, red. You then write the code to make the test pass. And that last line is incredibly important. Make your code better to read. Not shorter, better. So I've got a great example of that. One, one Friday, I had this brilliant idea about dynamic queries and <coughs> dynamic tables and databases. And I, I wrote a, a complete system to manage the entire database and it was all dynamic, it was incredibly clever. And on Monday, I could not even de begin to debug it. It was terrible code, because it was so hard to read. And the only reason I wrote it like that in the first place is as I was thinking about it, I thought, oh yeah, we could do this, we could do this. But come Monday, I don't have that thought process anymore. It's been 24 hours, guys, come on. Let alone six months. And uh, th th there is a quote. <laughs> I, I have to admit, I can't remember who, who gave the quote, but it, it said, always code as if the guy that's going to maintain it after you is a serial killer and knows your address. <laughs> because yeah, the, the traditional saying is, debugging code is twice as hard as writing it. So if you write it to the best of your abilities, it's, you, can't, you can't debug it. So, the red cycle. So you, you write your tests for a class or method, that doesn't exist. So that's a new requirement. I need a, a class or a method. I said the test will, and it's in brackets, should fail. <laughs> One of the interesting things happened, <laughs> why I put should, is because I needed a new class. So I wrote the test, which instantiated the class, and it ran. I was like, what? In my pro path, in one of the three or four hundred lines or, or classes that I have, I already had a class with that name. Now, messing around with your pro path causes chaos. Because if you name your classes the same, but, oh, I've got a customer maintenance.w and I've got an order maintenance.w, if you get your pro path wrong, you run the wrong maintenance.w. So one of the things you should maybe look at is is not having duplicate file names. And writing that test showed me that I had a problem even before I'd, before I'd written a line of code, which was interesting because it, it should. It shouldn't have instantiated. It should have failed. So this makes you think of the functionality you're testing. What exactly am I going to write a test for? Rather than I need to test this block of code, you're thinking straight away about how I should write my, my code. And you should write the code required to pass the test only. This is where we come to the gold plating things again. If you write a bit of code, and then you think, oh, I'll just add this in. It's not required. You are wasting your time. You are adding complexity. You are adding potential bugs. For what? You haven't been asked to do that. If you think that it should be doing this, you need to go back to the stakeholder. 
and say, have you considered this as well? Because it was the first thing I thought of when I, when I started writing it. Are you explicitly not wanting that, or didn't you think about that for the, in the specification? So it encourages dialogue between the, the various stakeholders and developers and project managers and team leaders and everything like that. It makes you think. I always, always struggle with that first part because I like writing code and I like to show off how clever I am. And it's incredibly difficult not to do that. But if you get into the habit, it makes the fact that you can then write more code for other things because you're not spending your time writing stuff that you don't need. So as an example, a new method must, given an integer input of 42, return false. OK, it's a complete BS function, but that's the specification that's requ requirement. What is enough code to make that pass? <coughs> so we've got, given an input value of 42, return false. We're, we're defining a public um, logical uh, method because we've got the return false, so by definition, it must return a logical. If A is 42, return false, excellent. Else return true, yes, else return true. Who asked for that else? Why, why would I return true? What's the point? What's the purpose? It's a small example, but I've added 50% more code by just thinking, oh, I'll just add that in. So we said it should only return 42 if it's false. All other values are undetermined. We do not know what the other values are. What happens if it's unknown? What happens if it's minus? What happens if it's below 42, above 42? There's at least three or four different requirements in there that, that I could think of just in this one line of code. So ha has, is the specification wrong? So no requirement, no test. If there isn't a requirement for the test you're writing, you don't write the test. Save yourself some time. Otherwise, you're writing code that may never be used. Or worse, give unexpected results. That's better still slightly wrong because it returns, returns false at any value now. So now we're at a stage where we've written probably not enough code because it's not following the specs. So you can see how, how complicated this. Just a simple single function here with a single line of code. As, as we can talk about it for about five minutes, the, the requirements for it, the, the function. So it, it makes you, or it makes the, the developer and, and the, the guy writing the spec much more, uh, or makes them collaborate a lot more. Because uh, it also depends on the type of developer you have. If you have a, a free thinking spirit like me, then I go out and write all sorts of stuff off spec. Um, other developers just do what they're told. Either way, it's bloody dangerous. Because you've got someone who writes a whole heap of stuff or someone who might see that there's a problem, but because he hasn't been told to, to do anything about it, won't tell you. So again, you, you've got to try and encourage the, the feedback loop with, with everyone on this. So yeah, we, we've basically talked about this. Um, that's the important question that the developer should be asking. What are the other requirements? Because as a as an input, 42 is fine, you know, meaning of life, universe, everything. Um, does that satisfy the requirements? Probably not, but we need to identify that. So you can see as a, as a more complicated function, if you said to a developer, write me a customer ordering system, that's just not going to cut it. Because what's it meant to do? How is it meant to function? How many, and so on and so forth. So every time you get a new requirement, you write a new test. 
which is part of the suite, which is part of the program, which is part of the code. And after we've gone green with our tests, we should make it more readable, more understandable. Remember, psychotic serial killer is after you. And you do not want the, the, the issue sometimes where we, we all face, where developers have to get together and discuss a bit of code that was written 12 years ago because nobody understands it. Or worse, we have a... <laughs> I, I can't ask for hands up on this. Who's got a block of code that everyone goes, not me, I'm not touching that because I have no idea what the bloody thing does. And if we alter anything, it might fail, so no. So this block of code has lived for 30, 40, 50 years. Yes, well, everybody. <laughs> um, so make it maintainable, readable, and it, it promotes good co code quality. And if you refactor, because you've got your unit test, you know it's not broken. So you, you can strip out as much as you want, remain it, move it around. As long as that unit test still works and returns all the results for all the expected inputs, it doesn't matter what you do to the gut. Your, your input output or your, your interface makes all the difference there and your unit tests help you do that. Don't repeat yourself. Or, AKA, cut and paste programming. Don't cut and paste code. Do not. Do not repeat code. If you've got code that repeats, put it in a function where you can call it. Because if you find a bug in that bit of code, you fix it once. <laughs> uh oh. Test case, well, yeah, we're talking about code rather than test code, so yes, don't get clever on me. Um, writing test is awful, okay? I'm just going to say that. It's horrible. Um, if you use a lot of frameworks, it helps a lot. But yeah, it's, uh, uh, he's right there. You, you, you do get to a stage where uh, unit tests sometimes repeat themselves, but it's a matter of necessity. Because what you can do is go, is go really clever and start creating a dynamic test class and dynamic, but then your test code is more complicated than your code, which is even worse, because nobody wants to write test code. So it promotes quality of the code right from the start. We've got our good quality code because we've tested each part, part of the function, we've tested each part of the inputs and the outputs promotes loosely coupled code. Uh, what we mean by that is that I always try and write my methods or my functions or my procedures as a black box. So if it needs information, it gets passed in rather than relying on state in, in, in the class itself or as a shared variable. God help us, who uses shared variables? Yes, yes. <laughs> we actually have some progress here. I think shared, new shared, shared, and global should be on a keyword forget list. And really, guys, you should try to consider that because it does inform. Sorry. Um, it, it does enforce better coding. Um, if I could have put include files on a keyword forget list, I would. <coughs> because that's just horrible. Um, and no lock. Everything should be no lock. So. I, I do find it ridiculous that progress have no lock and a no lock option as an optional extra. It should be by default no lock and share lock. You should go, yeah, I want to shoot myself in the foot. Minus, minus, sh shoot myself. <laughs> anyway, that's my rant. So it gives you the confidence because your tests, you know that you're running, everything like that. Keeps unused code out of your system. The amount of time. <laughs> I, sp I spent some uh, time debugging this program. Uh, there it was something about some uh, e uh, ERP connection to SAP, and we, we'd had a, a messaging bus p p as part of this, and it, it wasn't working. I spent a day or two going through the code base, trying to figure out exactly why this, and I, I came up with about three different programs where there, there may be this issue. Two of them, it turns out, haven't been used for 10 years. 
but they were still in the code base. Don't do that. If, you, if you're going to replace a program, remove it. You've got version control peeps. You don't need to comment out this block of code and say, we may need this at some stage. Don't do it, just because it will find it in the, in the search. It will waste your time. Remove all unnecessary code. If you're starting with, with TDD, you find the bugs quickly rather than at the deployment. Oh, I do have. Excellent. Code complete. So coding is X. If, if we find it while we're coding, it's a factor of one. After developers start looking at it, it's five. Feature complete is 10, because it's in fact affecting the entire QA cycle. If it's in a release candidate, it's 50. And if it's in gen general availability or release, it's a 1,000 times more expensive. That hurts the bottom line. It really, really impacts on, on the bottom line. Because if you think of the, if a, if a coder fixes the bug while he's working on it, it's just him. If it's gone out to, to GA, it's your customer. It's the users of your customer. It's the um, customer service rep. It's the release manager. It's the project manager. It's the um, oh, can't reproduce it on our system type, type person as well. And you can imagine all those people spending even 10 minutes, 20 minutes on that. It's huge. But let's get it down to where the developer is. So our goal is to write bug-free software. I'll pay a $10 bonus for every bug you fix. It drives behavior. And yeah, if, you, if you want your, your devs to be writing themselves a minivan, great. But uh, not what they're there for. They're there to, make, to write proper code, better code. Love doing that. Just love it. There's so many things. I hope this drives the right behavior. Yes, well, the point ahead boss is right. It does drive the right behavior for the developer, not for the company. Code coverage and re regression testing. I've, well, I've, we've come on to regression testing before because we know that if we introduce a new feature and we run our unit tests, if it works, it hasn't affected anything. There's no regression. Recurring bugs. Hands up who have said, I'm sure I fixed that before. I know I fixed that before. Where, where's that bit of code gone? And et cetera, et cetera. It stops that. It gives you a clean API because your um, tests are, because you're writing your tests, your code by definition has to be uh, uh, better separated. Reduce debugging, reduce development costs. That, that's just obviously um, part of the thing. When I say development costs, I really should probably say uh, bug fixing costs. And I, I, I think, well, my, my personal opinion being an evil bastard is that I think. Uh, Every software house should have a, a bug fix department where bad developers are put. Because that will soon make them realize that if they write bad code, they're going to have to be in quarantine for God knows how long. So that's probably why I'm never a manager. <laughs> I've kept sacked. Just a, I've got a couple of examples here, real world examples of, because <laughs> I once did this presentation without actually having done it, put it into practice. So I felt a bit of a hypocrite. So I thought I should actually try this. So Maya was a uh, code generator for, for open edge uh, things. And I thought, right, I, I was struggling with it because there was bugs all over the place and trying to fix this. I was patching it. And this little bit down here caused that problem. I started writing it with TDD. I found four bugs in progress. Not in my code, in progress. And there were some really bizarre ones. If you have a return in a finally block, you can't return a long char. You can return every other data type, but not long char. So, don't know why. Recursive delete of a directory fails if you have a path containing a dot, or starting with a dot. <laughs> These are all incredibly bizarre things. Um, my, the JSON parser fails if you have comments, which 
you could possibly understand because comments shouldn't be part of a JSON file. But it's, it's one of those things. And if you use a static property as a method as part of a parameter, it causes a GPF. So just by running these unit tests, I, was, I wrote the test, I then wrote the code, I ran the test, and the test failed because of these, these issues. So very, very interesting. We only found two bugs after we released it. The entire thing. Um, extents weren't generated at all because I hadn't written a spec for uh, having extents. And custom properties assigned to a DB weren't, weren't working properly. The UI, I didn't have any unit tests for. And there were bugs all over the place. So it was an interesting um, comparison between the front end and the back end with unit tests and not unit tests and TDD. Uh, the other one that we've done uh, recently, uh, we, we have a, or, or build one has a, a, a security platform, a, a, a secret store, uh, logins and, and all that sort of stuff. This is written in Nest and, and Angular. And again, we started off by saying we are going to write this 100% starting from scratch with uh, TDD. As it currently stands, we have 722 tests and 100% lines of code coverage. So every line of code, every branch, every if then else, every ternary operator has tests for it. And we cover 100%. So if we add a new feature, we should still get 100 greens everywhere. We did. We added a new SAML auth uh, module, a secure token, and a MySecrets module. We ran a test suite, and we found two regressions. Two. So you'd expect a new module not to affect the existing code. But it was just the way that we instantiated the modules and plugged them in with the um, one of the modules then required an additional dependency, which we hadn't picked up on. And we ran the test suite, and because we tried to instantiate that module, it fell over because it, it was missing a dependency. And we've, we've deployed now several versions uh, without any known regressions or bugs. It makes a huge difference. And the, the issue is it's a big time in investment. Um, when you tell your dev team or you, you tell the, the dev manager or the stakeholder it's going to take twice as long, they're not going to be happy. Unless they buy into the, it's short-term pain for a long-term gain. And that's, that's what you must sell, is that overall, if you take the um, you know, one or two release cycles, it's going to save so much time, so much effort, and so much development costs, and allow us to develop faster, because we can now uh, develop code instead of uh, fixing code. It is harder than you think. It is really hard to, to maintain the, the attitude that I will write a test. When you're under pressure, when you're being forced to, to write code quickly, it's very easy to go, oh, I'll come back to that, I'll come back to that. If you do that once and come back to it, fine. If you do it twice, three times, four times, you're not going to go back to it. And so you're going to be stuck with that. It's hard to sell to developers. Developers do not like writing tests. They hate tests. It's boring. It's rubbish. It's nasty. And now it's a fundamental part of their, <laughs> their life. Uh, it, it is very hard to, to convince that. And of course, you're, you can't be called a hacker anymore because you're following the rules. And Sometimes that is also hard. So, what is a unit test? I, one of the things that um, I, I try and promote in, in, in our code writing now is that one method, one function should do one job. Just make it, if you, if you have to have three functions then to do the same job, that's fine because you're, you're separating out the concerns with this one. Um, so a unit test should run in isolation with other code tests. Um, it should be targeted, repeatable, and predictable. Those last three things are the important things because 
your tests should not depend on the time of day. It shouldn't depend on whether you're wearing a yellow shirt or not or whether you've thrown chicken bones at somebody. It should always run the same. It should always return the same. It should always be repeatable, and you know what it's going to do. If your unit test now takes 10 minutes to run instead of five, it may pass, but there's something wrong because it was always five minutes. It's now 10. Have you got a wrong index now? Have you... Um, who, who uses of? Find customer of or find orders of? You don't do that. It's, the code doesn't change, but if you add indexes, the R code changes because the, the progress compiler looks at what it reckons the best match is and, and builds that index information into the R code. So your program can suddenly stop doing something or start doing something, and you can go, nobody's changed anything. And they haven't. Be explicit in your, your queries. Um, we, one of our customers um, thought it would be a good idea to put the same field name, so everything was ID in, in the tables, and they then indexed that. And suddenly their system stopped working because they, everything now was related to everything. So <laughs> every of started uh, working, which was, again, unpleasant. So you want to achieve good design. You want to be able to um, understand what you're trying to write. And th that's, that's done by specs. That, that's done by someone who says, I want it to behave like this. And this is the input, this is the output, and that's the way it should be. If, you're, if your component requires too many dependencies, it becomes difficult to test. Because what are you testing? If, you, if your little function requires the entire framework to be loaded before you can start testing, it's, your unit test ain't going to go anywhere because you're, you're incredibly difficult to, uh, to fire that up. So you need to be able to make your code um, as, as dependency-free as possible because then you can black box test it, you can separate it out, you can uh, manage it much, much better. Um, that is hard to do as well, unfortunately. I like to think of code smell as a, as a, as a thing. If I look at some uh, a block of code or, or a code base, you can tell if it smells or not just by looking at it because, man, that's some rancid code. <laughs> by, by, by refactoring your code, you make it easier for not only you but other people to, to look at it. So as I said earlier, each method and class should only have one um, responsibility. You sh inheritance. I, I used to like inheritance. I thought it was really cool. And I went overboard and went to about eight or nine levels of inheritance. And trying to debug that is just impossible. Because you look at the code and it's referring to some property. And that property is not defined in the code you're looking at. So now you've got to go digging. You say, oh, maybe it's in this superclass or that superclass or that subclass. Or it is super hard, really, really hard to debug inherited code. It's, it's at the same level as include files with conditional compiling in it. It's, it's nasty, really nasty. <clears throat> the Likoff substitution, I'm a self-taught programmer, so I didn't know half these terms until I, until I bumped into someone who had this education. I went, oh, that's the Likoff substitution principle. Go, really? OK. I, I just thought it was, if I had the same interface, I could replace it. What you should be able to do is plug in procedures, methods, and, and classes, and replace them without the application breaking at all. So that's something you should look at with that. Uh, dependency inversion and interface segregation. These, these are things that are sometimes quite difficult to do in progress, um, but are more of a JavaScript, TypeScript, or other languages that, that handle that. We can do um, certain 
certain things in, in own pledge with, with classes and inheritance and overrides and, and everything like that. Dependency injection, dependency inversion is, is actually quite difficult uh, to achieve. Um, but it's something you should look at. Now, what that principle means is that you inject into the, the class everything that it needs, rather than the class getting, finding out what it needs. Because then during testing, you can inject mocks uh, in, into the system. So, mistakes and repeated mistakes, duplicated code, any function or any method that has more than 100 lines of code in is wrong. Okay, I'm being very, very principled here and very, very prescriptive. If it's more than 100 lines of code, I like looking at a function in my editor, and I look, like looking at the whole function in my editor because I can see what it's doing. If I'm having to go up and down, up and down, where's that variable, where's that defined? Where, your, <coughs> your concentration is, 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 is complicated. Now, here's a co controversial method, uh, uh, idea. Do not put comments in your code. Everyone's going, <laughs> if you're putting comments in your code, you haven't written it right, so it's not understandable, or there's some function in there that you're doing some, some magic that you're having to explain. Either way, it's probably bad for anyone coming after you. So the amount of, again, the amount of times I've seen <laughs> date, time, author, made this change, date, time, author, made. who cares? It's in the version control. You don't need it in your source code. When you're looking at source code, you want to be able to read the damn thing. You don't have to scroll through 10,000 lines of someone thinking, oh, someone might want to know this in the future. <laughs> don't say my code. No, my, my code <laughs> Mm -hmm. Look at the comments and the consensus doesn't <laughs> Exactly. And that's part of the problem. You're now having to do double the work because you're going to have to go through all the bloody functions to figure out, have I changed what they're saying? <coughs> Absolutely right. What's even worse, <laughs> I'll, I'll raise you, is someone's got all these comments in the code, they then copy it to another program because they've done copy and paste programming so now all the comments, and even the file name in the comments is wrong. Don't comment. Sorry. Just <clears throat> Bad names. You, you rename something I. Death bar I. What the hell's I? <laughs> so it, 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 cognitive overload on, on this coding is, is, is something that is a thing. If you're having to try and work out and figure out what everything does before you're actually looking at the functionality, it takes a huge amount of time. Here's a good example. Getting a value. And we're defining pi as 3.14159265359. I could go on, I won't, I'm not that much of a geek. Return A star A, A times A times B times P. If you know what that function does, you are a true geek, and I hate you. It's pizza. It's the volume of a cylinder, I believe. <laughs> same code, same function, same lines, but you can now understand what it does just by looking at it. You haven't changed anything apart from make it more readable. And who cares if it's get cylinder volume as opposed to get value? What does get value mean? So writing your code is not just about writing unit tests. It's about writing good code, meaningful code, readable code. And oh, right, I'm, I'm returning the radius squared times the height times pi. It, it's obvious what this function does. Something so simple. So with, with code refactoring, what you try and do is you, you try and separate out all these functions into reusable stuff. Um, so there may be a function buried in the middle of this thousand lines of, of code, that this block of code you think, well, that's repeat, so that's, I could use that somewhere else. And most of us copy it and paste it somewhere else. 
You shouldn't. You should extract it, make it a function, and then call that function from within that code. So you simplify the code down, down, down. And we sort of replace conditionals with polymorphism. I'm not entirely sure I agree with that now. Uh, as I said, I've, I've been through an OO journey over the last 20 years, and I've gone like this, and oh, that's fantastic, and oh, this is terrible. Um, overriding and polyform. Uh, when it comes to debugging code, it's incredibly difficult to do. Um, it, it functionally, it, it's great, but trying to debug code is really hard with that. So, code which is complicated, very hard to fix, hard to maintain, hard to test. Um, if you've got, as I say, a, a thousand line function, there's a lot of code in there that would be hard to test each edge case for. If you're writing a test after writing code, it smells. If you're not writing tests, it smells. It's uh, as simple as that. Duplicate logic in tests, as, as it was pointed out there by Marion. And any code apart from asserts and setup in your test code introduces logic into your tests, which introduces bugs in your code. There's nothing worse than trying to test something that has a bug in the fundamental test because you're not sure what's going on. <laughs> because your function works, but your test doesn't. But your test is saying that your function doesn't work. So it, it's, it's horrible. Try and remove as much logic as possible from your tests. Just invoke the function and check the assert. But when I say assert, it means does this return what I expect? So really, that, that's what you need to do. Apparently, any more than three or four lines of code, and you have a 90% chance of introducing a bug. That's quite scary. It's quite amazingly scary. If you have to remove tests, something is, you need to consider that. So if you're removing a test, it's either because the test is failing and you don't want it to appear in your report, which I've seen happen. Hey, we're 100% now. You've, you've removed 40% of the test. <laughs> um, tests should not depend on another test. Uh, again, this is one of the hard things. And if you're testing, say, a, a, a customer module, and your test suite fires up the database, and test A creates the database, test B deletes the database, and test C, sorry, no, customer, and test C checks if the customer exists, they have to exist and work in that order then all the time. You can't test in parallel. You can't test out a sequence. So the results of a test should never depend on another test. So you shouldn't say, I'm going to fire up test A and that creates a customer. Test B, does a customer exist? That's, that's, that's wrong. So your, your first test should create a customer, and your second test should create a new customer and check for that one if you're going to update it. So you should be independent of each other. Try not to have multiple asserts per test. Um, you can have multiple tests per test suite, but if you've got um, assert A is true, assert B is true, assert C is true, you probably should split those into three separate tests because you're, you're checking for three different conditions out of one result, which isn't exactly the best. So for, for best practices, test reviews um, is, is always good to, to throw it uh, amongst the developers. I like doing that, manually introducing a bug. I like deliberately breaking the code so that I know my test suite fails. Because then I know my tests are accurate. Um, and as we say, write tests first and make tests isolated. In, in our... Um, for progress, that's, that's quite hard. Mocking data is hard. But with Docker these days, it's very, very, very easy to spin up a database for every test. So you, you have an image with a known set of data, your Sports 2000, for want of a better um, system. That, that database is preceded, preloaded, and then when you run your tests, you fire up a new Docker container with that database. You run your tests, you throw it all away. Start a second test, start another container with the 
initial seeded data. So with the advent of Docker, that has become so much better, so much easier. And you, you don't necessarily now need to mock data because you've got a database that is in a known consistent state always. None should fail. Lord of the Rings, none shall pass. Um, your integration test should be in a separate project. You know, that's, that's, that's a whole different uh, thing. One of the interesting things about testing only publics, if you've got a whole heap of private methods, how are you going to test those? Because by definition, they're private. So your test suite can't access them. So that's something you need to think about. But if the only entrance into this class is through method A, and you're relying on 20 or 30 different private methods inside that, you are now testing a huge amount of code just for that one method. So try and um, see if you could split out some of those private methods into a library and a function that you can call, rather than keeping that within there. Um, use separate methods or refactor code into helpers. We, we tend to um, create helper codes for classes rather than uh, individual classes so that we can separate out uh, mocks and things. Make tests readable rather than maintainable. <laughs> if, you, if you're trying to say, oh, my test is only three lines long, but you can't read it, it's not going to help. It might be 10 lines long, but if it's readable, it's much better for the next guy to come across. We've talked about state isolation, we've talked about keying up its own state, and uh, we talked earlier about how every test should be repeatable. You should be able to run the same test a million times and get the same result every time. And use variables instead of constants, because it makes it readable. If, well, here's an example. Here's a test. So we've got a test hash one. Oh, that smells straight away. Data is char, data is geocode, get GPS, Maitland South End. <coughs> Assert is not null or empty. So whatever we're doing with the GPS, we want to make sure that, that that's uh, not empty. OK, test works. Let's have some good naming. Again, making a code more readable. It's longer. But now we're saying coordinates, we're saying town, we're saying building. And we're saying the coordinates is the get GPS of the building and town. It makes the code, makes the test so much more readable. And if it's readable, it can be fixed a lot better. Mention, again, mentioned earlier, tests should be run in any order. Test A should not be um, dependent on test B and vice versa. Um, you, you should name variables ap appropriately. Start using interfaces to facilitate tests. So rather than passing in a, a concrete class name, pass an uh, interface as a parameter. And then you can pass whatever object you want in into that. So the three pillars are readable, maintainable, and trustworthy. Trustworthy is, is the key here. You need to trust your code because then it's it's much better for the organization. Um, there are a couple of books here. Um, the Art of Unit Testing is brilliant. It's a great book. Oh, I, I, my favorite book. I've, I, bought, I bought it actually about three times because I keep losing it. No, oh, I can't find it. So I'll buy it again. It's a really, really good book. It was based on C Sharp um, at the time. But the principles of it are, are, are very good. Same with uh, the clean code. Dependency injection is just for you geeks out there who really want to get into this nerdy uh, dependency injection stuff. The obligatory My Little Pony. Um, several years ago, I made a mistake by naming a class My Little Pony. I then presented this, I did this presentation, and the method was do stuff with My Little Pony. And Peter Judge, God bless him. Uh, picked up on that very, very quickly and very loudly and very publicly. And my, my, my sin, or my, my payment for this, is I've got to talk about My Little Pony at every presentation that I do. And I am still 
suffering from that. I got away with it yesterday, or I thought I had until the reception, when two different people came and said, where's my little pony? <laughs> so I put it in this morning. <laughs> Basically, my daughter walked in when I was writing this code, and I was trying to think of a decent method name. And I thought, oh, it's my little pony, that'll do. And I didn't think of the wider consequences. Anyway. I'm sticking to that because if I don't, <laughs> I get I get I get attacked, which is quite quite. I mean, the, Paul Kufalis, uh, he he was under a similar punishment because years back, 15, 20 years back, he was meant to do a presentation at the start of the day, and he wasn't there. He didn't turn up for his own presentation. Uh, <laughs> And so Tom stepped in, and they, and they he swapped his presentations over. Paul came down about 20 minutes later, claiming that um, his internet alarm clock had gone offline and hadn't woken him up. <laughs> and we laid into him so badly for the next 10 years. And his punishment was to get the first slot on the Friday, every conference. <laughs> and uh, I believe Mike Fechner's let him off that now. And I, so I'm wondering what I've done wrong now. But anyway, any, any questions on, on this? Oh, one in the back. Thoughts doubles the development time. Mm -hmm. In your experience, since you do 100% coverage, does TDD increase the development time even more? Yes. yes. What, what, what we found is because we, once we've reached that state, so you know, let, let's ignore the path of getting to that point. Once we've reached that point of 100 lines of code um, <coughs> coverage, any new stuff that we write, we're still writing the test for. So that bit of the code still takes longer to write because it's still writing the test for. But the integration of that code into the code base is instant because the rest of the code is, is, is tested. So we know that. The, the integration of the new module or the, or the change that we've made hasn't broken anything. Mm. It, it, we, we can trust that code so that we can implement it and go on to the next, next functionality almost straight away without having to come back, wait for this bit of code and test and everything like that. So once, once you've reached that level, if you stick to writing your tests, yes, that bit of code takes a little longer, but A, your, pro, your developers are used to it now. They like it now because it, it gives them much more stability and predictability. And so they write it quicker. It, it's a virtuous cycle. It gets faster and faster and faster to a point where the, the code you're churning out, outside edge cases, you know doesn't have any known bugs. I'm not saying it doesn't have any bugs, because you might not have written a test. And if you haven't written a test, it's because you haven't had the proper spec. So it all feeds back on itself. Yes. What if you start from scratch? Brand new project, brand new team. And you know from the beginning that it's going to take way longer. How do you sell this off? And how do you estimate the initial effort? You, you have to sell it off in, in, for the long term. It, it's not a short term thing. It, it just isn't. There, there's nothing you can do to sweeten that pot. It, it's going to take longer initially to write, yes. But the benefit of, of, of not having the bugs is your software is so much more reliable for your customers. It's a hard sell. I'm, I'm not even going to try and say, oh, it's easy. It's an incredibly hard sell. But if you show the benefits of fixing a bug now, as opposed to fixing a bug in, in production. And the, the amount of time that your programs are now spending writing functional code instead of bug fixing has got to be a benefit. Because you're, if, as I said earlier, if half your developers are fixing bugs and they're being paid, what, 80,000 pounds a year each, and you've got 10 developers, so five of them, 200,000 pounds a year that you're paying to fix bugs. Instead of writing code. When you put it like that. <laughs> <laughs> developers are expensive. So their time should be spent writing function, not fixing issues. 
it is a hard sell, but if you, if you get that money, or sorry, you get that, that idea of expense into the financial controller's head, generally he makes it happen. Okay. And then We're there. It's uh, 10 o'clock. <laughs> ah, we've been thrown out. All right, guys, well, I'm around for the next couple of days, so if you want to have a discussion on the subject.